Because your interface to the Unix system is the shell, you need to understand how to use the shell and all the features it provides. And that's really what this class is all about. This section, we're going to talk about shell meta characters and give you some examples of how they're used. The first thing you need to be able to do is to redirect the output of a process to another place besides the default destination, which is your terminal. You may be familiar with the greater than character. The greater than character tells the shell to connect this process up to another data stream. For example, when you run the date command, it sends the output to your terminal. Suppose you wanted to store the date command in a file. In that case, you enter the command date greater than and the name of the file. In this case, I've sent it to a file called login.times. Let's take a closer look at exactly what this command line says. It's actually two pieces. The first is the name of the program to execute, and the second is a description of how the shell is to create this process. It identifies where the standard output of that process is to be connected. These two parts of the command line do entirely different things. Date is actually executed as part of the process. The greater than login.times, however, is used by the shell when it creates the process. And as such, it is not part of the date command. It's part of how the process is to be created. That means that greater than login times is actually a description that is meant for the shell. As such, the shell removes those directions from the command line and in fact simply executes the date command. Because the shell has connected the output of the process to login.times, date runs without knowing where its output is to go. That's part of how the process gets created. To show you that the shell removes the redirection from the command line, let's run the command backwards. Notice if I type greater than login.times space date, the command runs as it was before. If the shell doesn't remove the redirection from the line, this command line would get an error message. The fact that the command executes means that the shell must have changed the command line so that only date was left. Otherwise, we'd have seen an error message. The point of this is that shell meta characters are meant to be interpreted by the shell. And as such, they will either be removed from the command line or they will be changed into something else. This is part of the three-step process I mentioned in section one. After you enter a command line, the shell searches it for meta characters. If it finds a meta character, it will change the command line or it will understand how to create the process because that's the purpose of the meta characters. However, you don't see what the shell does to a command line and might not be aware that your command line is getting changed. If you take a look at the last two commands we've entered, it's the same command line redirecting the output of date into the file login.times. Logically, you would say that we should have two lines of output in the file. But let's take a look at the contents of login.times. As you can see, there's only one line of output in the file. That's because the greater than says to overwrite any existing data in the file with the new output. That means that the line that the first command put into the file was erased when the second line was written into it. If you want to preserve what's in the file and add new data to the end of the file, you can do this with a second kind of redirection, the double greater than. The double greater than says to add the output of this process to data that's already in the file. This is sometimes called append redirection. Let me show you how it works. Let me run the date command with the double greater than 
and then the file login.times. If I now take a look at the contents of login.times, I can see that it contains two output lines. That's because the double greater than says to add the output of the second date command to the output that already is in the file. In addition to redirecting output, you also can redirect input with the less than character, and you can also redirect the standard error of a process. Depending on which shell you use, you redirect the standard error either with two greater than, if it's the born shell, and greater than ampersand, if it's the C shell. It turns out different shells use different meta characters in some cases, although by and large they use the same ones. From here on in, I'll describe the born shells version of the meta characters. The course notes will describe other meta characters that are used by the seashell and the corn shell. In addition to the redirection meta characters, we have a second kind of meta character called process control meta characters. You're probably familiar with one of those as well. It's the ampersand which tells Unix to run a command in the background. Another kind of meta character that controls process execution is the semicolon. The semicolon tells the shell to execute two separate commands listed on the same command line. For example, this command line says to run the date command and then to run the who command. When run together, these two commands would tell you the current time and who was logged on, which might be useful information. You can run the two of them on the same command line by connecting them together with the semicolon. Suppose you want to send the output of both of these commands into a file. The parentheses shell meta character combines commands together. That is, it combines their output into a single stream. This command line, f executed, will take the output of the date command, then execute the who command, combine both of their outputs, and send it into the file called login.status. We've used several shell meta characters in this command line. The parentheses, the greater than, and the semicolon are all shell meta characters that will be removed from this command line. What's left is simply the command date and the command who. The rest of the information on the command line is meant to describe how to create the processes to generate the output you want. The semicolon performs sequential execution of two unrelated commands. Another shell meta character performs a kind of sequential execution. However, it allows you to execute one command such that its output is inserted into the command line of a second command. For example, I want to put the message logged in at and the date into login.times. To do this, I have to perform two steps. First, I need to run the date command, and then I have to put the output of date and the words logged in at into the login.times file. I can perform both of these steps on a single command line using a special shell meta character. The back quotes allow me to combine the output of one command with command line arguments of a second command to do two things at once. In order to print arguments into a file, I use a special Unix command called echo. What I want to do is echo out the message logged in at and then the output of the date command. Using the back quotes, I can tell the shell execute the date command, take the output of the date command, and send that with the other command line arguments to the echo command and put the whole thing into the login.times file. This command line shows you how to do that. Note that the date command is enclosed inside back quotes. That would get executed first. 
the output of the date command would then be combined with the words logged in at. All of those would be sent as arguments to the echo command, which then sends all of its output into the redirected file login.times. And you see its contents here. It's important to distinguish the forward single quotes from the backward single quotes. They're both standard characters on your keyboard. The back quotes I'm referring to are the ones that point from left to right and are not apostrophes. We'll talk about them in just a minute. A second kind of meta character allows you to combine sequential execution and redirection. The Unix system sends output as streams of characters and takes input as streams of characters. Up to now, we've only redirected things into and out of files. The Unix system also allows you to redirect things into and out of processes. Using a special pipeline meta character, which is a vertical bar, you can take the output of one process and send it to the input of another process. In essence, connecting two processes together so that the characters move from one process into the other and then out the other side. If I were to execute a command line that was A pipe B, the output of process A would be sent into process B as input. First, they all have redirectable input and output streams. Next, they always take their arguments off the command line. Third, filters provide text processing capabilities. The important thing about filters is that they can be placed in the middle of a pipeline. In essence, they can be used to process text as it moves through a series of commands in a pipeline. The Unix system treats text as simply a stream of characters. Filters view their input as lines of text, and they then process these lines of text depending on which filter you're using. For example, a filter that searches for patterns in text, in essence, removes those lines from its input that don't contain the pattern. Those that move through the stream are those that do contain the pattern. In sorting, a filter would take the input, rearrange it, and then send it on its way. Editing and formatting take input, read the lines, and possibly change them or add something to them before they get sent on their way. By connecting filters up to one another in a pipeline, you can get a great deal of text processing done. And you'll be surprised how much text processing can do. For example, consider this common application. You have a series of names and addresses that you've stored in a file. And what you need are some of the names in that file printed in labels so you can paste them onto envelopes and send them to somebody. To make this more realistic, let's assume that you need the names of the people in California sorted by zip code, formatted into one-up labels. On most computers, you'd have to buy software or write software to do this conversion from data in the file to data on the printer. Because of the use of filters, Unix allows you to do this directly with tools provided by the system. The first step is to move the names through a searching filter to find those in California. Connect this up to a sorting filter, which will put them in zip code order. Then move them through a formatting filter, which will put them in one-up labels. If you want, you can send them directly to the printer, or you can store them in a file for use later. Printing selected names in a preset format is a common task done on a computer. On the Unix system, this can be done using three filters in a pipeline. 
The first step in being able to create these kinds of applications is learning how to use the important Unix filters so that you know the power they have to create these pipelines. We're going to cover four important Unix filters in this section and the next one. In order to provide an example that will pull all of this together, I've decided to focus on a computerized phone list. That's a common thing people want to have on their system and search through to locate people's phone numbers. On my system, I have a sample file called phone.list, which contains these names. This list has a very specific format. It's always the last name, a comma, a space, the first name, a tab, and then a phone number. Note the phone number has a specific format. It's always a number, a dash, followed by four numbers. In addition, there are no spaces or any other characters after the last number on each line. Because the format has been specified, it's easy to search for the different components in the phone list. If I want to search the list by phone number, it's important to note that a phone number always starts after a tab. If I wish to start searching for somebody's first name, I have to realize that the first name always follows a comma and a space. The last name always starts each line. One of the most useful Unix filters is a command that searches through text in a file for patterns that you specify on the command line. We'll use this with the phone list to locate people's names and phone numbers. The Unix searching filter is a command called grep. The people that wrote Unix could have named this anything like look or search or pattern, but they decided to call it grep and you'll just have to get used to it. Later on in this section, I'll tell you how grep got its name. Grep requires at least one argument. That argument has to be the pattern that you want grep to search for. Because grep is a filter, if you don't put any file names on the command line, it will simply search the standard input. If you want it to search one or more files, you can put their names on the command line as well. For example, suppose I want to search for people whose names contain a capital S somewhere on the line. I would run this command, grep space capital S space phone list. As you can see, this command found four lines containing a capital S in the phone list file. Three of them start with a capital S, the last one contains a capital S in the middle of the line. Because grep is a filter, I don't have to list the name of the file to search on the command line. Instead, I could redirect its input to read it from that file. This command would have the same exact output as the one I just entered. There's a third way to produce this same output. Because grep is a filter, I can stick it inside a pipeline. As an example, suppose I need to send the list of all the path names containing the video files that I've created for this videotape. And let's suppose I need to send those to a user named Rich who's collecting all this information. To locate all the files in the videotape, I can use this find command. Note I've piped those to the mail command and I'm mailing those names directly to user Rich. The process on the left finds the path names, the process on the right collects them together and mails them off to user rich. This is one example of how to create a pipeline. We'll see many more later in this tape. A third set of shell meta characters are the file matching wildcard characters. Now the different shells understand different file wildcard characters, except they all three understand asterisk, question mark, and the square brackets. These three file matching wildcard characters 
have been discussed in a previous tape and are fully described in the text. And I won't cover them anymore here. Other file matching wildcards that are recognized by the different shells are described in the course manual. The power of shell metacharacters allow you to describe in detail the process or processes you're trying to create. There's a problem with them, however. The shell always interprets metacharacters and does something with them. As a result, any meta character in a command line cannot get past the shell without being interpreted. This sometimes causes conflicts. For example, it turns out that Unix will allow any character to be in a file name except a forward slash. This includes shell meta characters. That means it's perfectly legal to create a file name like this one. This file might contain mail messages you'd receive from Rita and Rich. The problem is that the file name contains a shell meta character. If you try to execute this cat command to see what's in the file, you'll get a rude surprise. Is there anything you can do to stop the shell from interpreting meta characters? In fact, you can. You can do what we call quote meta characters. To quote a single character, use a backslash. The backslash tells the shell to ignore the special meaning of the character following the backslash. One way to run the cat command that we showed earlier is to put a backslash in front of the ampersand, which tells the shell to ignore the special meaning of the ampersand and to use it as a regular character. This cat command would work properly. In addition to using the backslash to quote a single character, you can use single quotes to quote a whole bunch of characters, in essence telling the shell to ignore everything inside the single quotes. This command would also work to list out what was in the file mail.rita and rich. This marks the end of section two. Please work the exercises at the end of this section before going on to section three.